Captain's Log Supplemental. We've got a visitor on board, a member of Section 31. We were ordered for a pickup and drop off in a system along our mission route. Uh, she won't deign to fraternize with the crew, but she won't break line of sight with me. I'm recording this from the privy just to get a moment's peace. I'm pretty sure she's just messing with me. I'm also pretty sure that all of Section 31's missions are made up just to justify their existence. My bowel movements certainly don't constitute an extreme threat that would warrant this level of surveillance. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Captain's Log Supplemental. My name is Stanford. I am joined, as every week, by my couple of friends, Chris. Hello. And Rob. Hello. And we are joined on and off by our producer, Mariah. Hi there. At some point, we need to find out what an actual producer is supposed to do so that we can decide whether or not she's doing a good job. <laughs> I was listening to Behind the Bastards, and sh their producer was just getting photos and sharing them of people that they were talking about. Yeah, so Sophie Lichterman. Yeah, she's yeah. really cool. So, like... From a film perspective, they basically just enable the the crew to do their jobs. And like executive producers just means that they spent their own they money spent, to do it. I was gonna say they paid for it, <laughs> yeah. Yep, that's what executive producer means. So wait, if we called Mariah executive producer, she would pay us money? <laughs> I mean that sounds uh, right. No. Oh man. Uh Captain's Log Supplemental, we are a Star Trek Rewatch Podcast, where we're watching all of the televised Star Treks in chronological order in the universe. So we are starting with Enterprise, in which we are currently digging through season two. Um, we are a, still a pretty new podcast. Um, we're coming up on a year in a few weeks here. Um, but uh, we would very much appreciate if you get the word out. Uh, you know, give us some ratings, some reviews, tell, talk, talk to people about us, talk to about people, the various Star Trek groups, et cetera, on the Intar webs. Um, I asked permission and was granted permission to post about the podcast in the Star Trek Enterprise subreddit. So, uh, we did get a, we did get a couple dozen people coming, coming around from that, but it's a pretty low traffic subreddit being like the, the backwater like star trek series that nobody watched shiz anymore dude like not only do we regularly rag on enterprise but now you're rag you're ragging on enterprise fans <laughs> <laughs> like, come on i don't mean i don't mean the fans themselves i mean like the show is is not one of the better right it's ones, not as beloved as so some therefore the, the subreddit is not quite as well populated yeah. yeah, you you uh, called I, it a backwater. Yeah, no, I called the if you if you if you read the record back, you will find that what I said was the show was a backwater. Oh my god! Of the other uh, shows. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think the nice way to put that would be it's <laughs> just it's just not as popular as some of the other shows. Look, if they kept their shirts on a few more episodes, maybe it could have been better. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Oh, so you've got your shirt off. <laughs> Look, we can't all be as sexy as Captain Picard with his shirt off, okay? Mm. <laughs> um. Oh, also in other news, um, our child, our nine-year-old, is listening to a Star Trek rewatch podcast. That little but traitor. It's, but it's not ours. <laughs> it's not ours. And he keeps mentioning how good it is. He says that the uh, the theme song to it is really good. Yeah, and he was like he, real, real stoked about that theme song. Oh, man. It, they're rewatching Prodigy, so it is it is uh, more oh, kid appropriate. Sure, that's but fun. he keeps asking me. He's like, "Which one do you think is better, Captain's Log Supplemental or the Prodigy rewatch <laughs> podcast?" Definitely I was like, the "Well, Prodigy rewatch podcast." There's no comparison. <laughs> like, one is appropriate for children and. One is not. I oh, will for say things here. I have listened to a few minutes of it here and there as, as Liam has it on around the house while he's eating lunch or whatever. We definitely bring a different energy to this than they do. Yeah. But they do. What's really sweet is they have a seven year old uh, also talk about each episode. So this 
adorable little seven-year-old writes a little paper that they read on air uh, about what they think about the episode. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, we could do that's that. Funny. Go get Liam and have him write a paper about what he thinks about Archer fucking a space log. Like, <laughs> no, we, we can't do that. As you've just demonstrated, every five seconds you drop an F-bomb. <laughs> Well, our kids used no, no, to that. No, no, no. Pay attention now. Yeah. Hoshi's going to lose her shirt. Let me, let me, let me know what you think about that. <laughs> Please comment on the unnecessariness of the horniness of Star Trek Enterprise. No, no. See, see here, his face falls directly into her breasts, and we pause. <laughs> Just really, really make sure you capture that in your nine-year-old summary of the episode. Mm-hmm. Although I will say one more thing about our child, who will be visiting with his with his cousin on Saturday. Uh, I asked him if he has any plans, and he said yes. Me and my cousin are going to sit around and hang out and have have conversations while you adults sit around, drink, and curse. Yeah, that sounds right. That sounds <laughs> He's not, absolutely like, I, accurate. I, I, so I, there's no no inaccuracy there. It's, yeah. it's no there's notes. No notes. That's hundred yeah. percent correct. Yeah. He, I've uh, been to your house and hung out. That is what. <laughs> <laughs> hey, sometimes we drink coffee. <laughs> Fair. It's fair. Occasionally um, there's a card game of some sort, but uh he actually said that on Friday he wants to start watching Voyager with me. And I'm like, yeah, man, if you want to, sure. Well, that's fun. Wait, hold on. His entries into the Star Trek universe first are going to mm-hmm. be Prodigy no. and Voyager. Yeah. No, da- data is his favorite character. Oh yeah, no, 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 that is true. He's seen he's seen first contact generations, oh, okay, undiscovered okay. country, and um the Kelvin ones. Like, I'm not saying those shows are bad by any means. I'm just saying that's a weird entry point. <laughs> he said that Data is fa- his favorite character because he has a cat that wanders around the spaceship. But Yeah, he, he like, uh, he, like I'm almost reticent to show him TNG because he thinks that this cat's just going to be there all the time. And I'm like, <laughs> no, no, dude, it's like one episode, maybe two. No, I mean, no, it's, to be fair, it's, it's at least four been. or five. Yes, I agree that that should have been a more regular part of the show, but it was not. <laughs> I feel like maybe you have that uh comic book about uh Jones that in from Aliens. Mm-hmm. I feel like that comic needs to be drawn of just Spot a, doing shit on the Enterprise. A day in the life of Spot, just like just like yeah. Spot living around the fucking Enterprise while <laughs> these horrifying things are going on. Yeah. <laughs> the the ghost fucking and the orgasm game, all that. Oh, Crusher and her sex ghost. Oh, the orgasm game. Yeah, maybe Data... I'm still the really upset about game. that. I didn't know that. <laughs> Data Data couldn't feed Spot because everyone was too orgasmed and they shut him down. That episode was fucking stupid. That was a, a terrible I episode. believe it was called The Game, too. Yes, it was. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure that's correct. Couldn't even put an effort into the title. Yeah. Um. Anyways, so this week... We're talking about a little episode called Dawn. The cold open is, well, we open into what I can only describe as shuttle pods and southern accents. So, like, you know, trips out on a little adventure. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure why he's just out here by himself. That seems like poor general practice. No, no. I mean, solo missions, totally safe and reliable. Don't worry about it. Yeah, and it's because, as we've established... Trip is the one who will suffer most in this entire show. Mm, that's an interesting statement that now I'm going to have to keep track of. Because <laughs> you're not wrong. A lot yeah, of shit happens to Trip. Card. Yeah. And like sometimes it happens to Trip and other characters, but very rarely is the bad shit happening to not Trip. Yeah. Huh. He's like the wharf of Enterprise. <laughs> right. <laughs> he's, he's the chief O'Brien of Enterprise. Dwarf. Yeah, there you go. That's probably more accurate, yeah. Um, as is the case in all Star Treks, it's never good news to see like an unknown ship in the cold open. Um, yeah. So, of course, Trip sees an unknown ship. The ship immediately just starts starts blasting. And yep. uh, they start crashing, and then we get a tone shift into Faith of the Heart. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He crash landed on one of 62 moons. One of 62 moons. So we um, come back, and we see this nice, like, kind of vignette. The... It is interesting to see that, like, the CGI and stuff is getting better as the show goes on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, like, there's, like, this fairly good, like, well-rendered gas giant and a bunch of moons and stuff in the background as the Enterprise Mm kind of 
nose is on by. Uh, they're trying to find a trip, but they're having trouble because the atmospheres of the moons contain some kind of random s- selenite or some shit, some made up bullshit that like makes uh, sensors, um, you know, disrupts sensors. Um, the last they had from him was he was about 50,000 kilometers away. Uh, but now they, and they, they think he was on a moon. So now they have to check all the moons. Um, I just want to note, this is like the second crash landing in the last like four episodes for trip. Yes. And 50,000 kilometers is not that far. Like, no, it's not. If they knew about where he was, 50, that they, they, they've got their search down to like one or two moons tops, but they're like, we got to check all 62. We cut back down to trip chagrin trip. He's chagrined like as his shuttle pod is all smoky and explosive. Uh, he starts off a chief engineer's log supplemental. And he says, for the record, I was attacked by a small craft. Like, yeah, man, this is your record. You don't have to say for the record. <laughs> um, but he's got to. Oh, go ahead, Rob. Did you also notice that every single one of his logs was a supplemental log in this episode? Yeah, I think it was because his his opening log was like the log entry, and then he's just everything supplemental to that. It's just no, because been... even the first one was supplemental. Was it? Well, it's just, I mean, maybe he started the chief, chief engineer's log. I'm having breakfast. I'll let you know what happens throughout my day. And then his day just took a fucking turn. <laughs> um, He's got to get his transceiver working. I don't. I don't know. The word transceiver I find to be weird, but I guess I guess it's a real thing. Um, When comm equipment breaks in Star Trek, like no matter why it breaks, like from a crash or a gunshot, it has to be like computer circuitry fixed. That's the only way to repair stuff in Star Trek. So he's got to pull like the entire circuitry board down out of the shuttle pod and then... I don't know, use a light screwdriver thing. <laughs> it makes a high pitch whining noise. That's all I know. We he hears a noise because uh, he's, he's on this crash plane. He's got a fire going and he's trying to fix his transceiver. Uh, he hears a noise. Uh, he grabs what looks to be a lightsaber, although he doesn't actually use the lightsaber part. So I'm guessing it's just like a piece of fucking metal that he's going to hit the guy with. Yeah. Um, the enemy, uh, the guy who shot him down, apparently has also crashed, comes to ambush him, fires and misses, but Trip kind of like hits the ground. And then instead of shooting Trip, the guy takes a moment to yell, <laughs> like kind of a lot, which gives Trip the chance to not get hit, not get shot. Apparently, Trip doesn't have a phase pistol. No, I was going to say that was one of my notes. I'm like, why is that not like a sidearm that you're on a, a lone mission with? Like, I feel like that should be standard. Yeah, you would think it would just be part of the away team kit in the shuttle pod. Mm-hmm. Right. Some kind of firearm, even if they're like, maybe they only have enough face pistols for the main armory. Well, you got to have something on the fucking shuttle pod. Um, we cut back to the Enterprise and uh, the Enterprise uh, is being approached by a ship. Um. And they, you know, they hail. And then Scott Bakula does the worst acting of this episode. Maybe the <laughs> season so far. You're it's very up, Scott. bad. <laughs> Cause he like, he's like, was it one of yours? He like yells it in this really not intimidating way. And I've realized that like intimidating Archer is the least intimidating Archer. Like, He can't be intimidating if he's trying to be intimidating. He's really, really bad at it. Um, Apparently, the other guys are assholes. Um, (laughs) Their their entire species, according to uh, the Vulcan expert, is, yeah, they're they're just genetically assholes. (laughs) (laughs) Not like just sentient assholes, like. No, no, that would be asshole okay. in behavior. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Genetically metaphorical assholes. Mm-hmm. Um, the guy, uh, to her credit, the guy comes on and goes, "Is that a Vulcan? Fuck you!" So they're, <laughs> yeah. you know, they're right just as racist back, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> he says that he has orders to destroy any ship that enters the system, which means that he's already violating those orders because they just kind of talk to the Enterprise. I'm not sure what the point of that is. Um, and Archer's like, well, our dude's 
down there. And he's like, meh. And then Archer's like, you know, we'll probably find him faster if we work together. And then we kind of, he kind of like chagrins. And then we cut back to Trip. Trip says in his log, whatever, knock my engines out, probably knocked out his too. I guess this is where I found out that there's something in the atmosphere that's preventing the engines from working. Because I thought the dude shooting him knocked his engines out. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, well, and that that's what kind of confused me at first, too, because I'm like, well, I saw the alien craft shoot him, but I don't ever see him returning fire. So why did the alien right. crash? But then we learned that there's stuff in the atmosphere that did that. So Right. I don't know if there was a cut line of dialogue or whatever, because that was the first time it was mentioned. Right. Um, the alien had stolen while he was shooting a trip, had stolen his transceiver computer equipment. He's trying to get it to fit. He's trying to fix it, too. Um, he like drops it in the sand at one point. I guess sand inside the computer equipment's okay. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's not conductive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Trip, to, in order to try to get his stuff back, he, he sets up a little recording of himself saying some stuff to kind of lure the guy away so he can sneak in behind him and get him. This yeah, that works. That was pretty fun. This works Ar fantastically. Armed with his trusty bonking stick. Yes, it works, except for the fact that for some reason, Trip has decided that he needs to take his sweet ass time he just really picking did. the thinking up and running with it. Like he's like counting something. He's like, I don't know, re-spooling some kind of wire. It takes him a while. So it doesn't really work because this dude just comes back. Um, they get into a little fisticuffs. Trip gets the kind of drop on him, points a gun at him. The guy's like on the ground in like a crouch. Uh, but then the alien, using expert tactics, sweeps Trip's legs, and then as Trip leaps back Sweep to his the feet, leg, he shoots him in the balls. Yeah, that's that like, was, I'm like my notes were, "Hey, Trip, want to fight?" Never mind. <laughs> that was the weirdest like ground roundhouse kick I've ever seen in my entire life. It was amazing. It was some very Van of uh, uh, Van Dam stuff. So it, since they told him to sweep the leg, sweep the leg, sweep the leg. <laughs> also, th this was the point of the show. I don't know, Stanford, do you remember what the name of the species is? Arconian. Yeah. And I, I kept thinking Argonian from like Elder Scrolls. And I was like, <laughs> oh, they're lizards. And like that comes into play later. I was going to say, I mean, it's not far off. No, yeah. No. I kind of, I was wondering if it might have been intentional. Right. So... This is the point where it's basically like we're in act two now. And this is the point where this is just an enemy mine ripoff, which we'll talk about more in the deep dive. Trip does some A plus translating here. Maybe he should be uh, the comms officer because he's like very roughly translating some shitty words that the aliens throwing at him. It's it's well, real. It's it's real rudimentary stuff. Well, that was after we had our, you know, tourist shouting at the locals version of, right. of conversation. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. Just Which, sh shout your language hey, at them. You know what? Get yeah. them to understand. It worked. So maybe you should you should back <laughs> off. <laughs> I mean, it turns out you don't need a universal translator when you've got a gun to your head. Yeah. Mm hmm. Um, we get back to the, uh, to the, uh, enterprise where we're like watching to Paul and Archer talk about these people. She says that we made contact. Oh, okay. Here's the line. We made con first contact over a hundred years ago, not long after they developed the warp drive. I don't know where the, the, the breaks in that sentence are because it sounded like she said we made first contact over a hundred years ago, not long after they developed the warp drive which implies that they made contact before, before? which like I thought that, was not their modus operandi. That is not what they do. But I, but I realized that like, maybe it's just a poorly written line. And she meant we made contact with them not long after they developed the warp drive over for yeah. oh, about a hundred years ago. Maybe yeah. that's what she meant. Maybe. Um, she says, uh, we tried working with them, but they were assholes and there was nothing we could do about it. Um, I'm starting to think that maybe Star Trek's just got some general kind of racism issues. Um, we get back to Trip and, uh, the alien, the alien is making Trip like fix his machine and it like zaps him and Trip says, damn it. Then the alien says, damn it. And we all have a laugh. It's a good time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was, that was pretty fun. I gotta be that was fun. Trip is thirsty. Guy throws him a canteen. My note is, boy, I hope that's water. But, <laughs> spoiler. It was not. It's kind of like mud. It's poop water. No poop water. Oh man, 
Maybe they're secotropes. Yeah, uh, I know what that is. Yep, 100%. <laughs> we do not need to explain what a secothamp is. What did you say? Secotrope. So, rabbits, uh, uh, which we have as a pet here, um, oh. consume secotropes. They are hind gut fermenters, and to extract all of the nutrition possible from a shitty food source like hay or grass, they reconsume their own poop. <laughs> Yes, I, I see sh- the I, I see the deconstruction of this word now, and it makes sense. Sister mm-hmm. is so proud right now, Rob. She is. She will <laughs> never listen to this. <laughs> nope, she'll never know. But she's proud. We're proud on her behalf. Okay, Trip is a complete jerk about the the gross liquid, and the dude's like, "Can you not throw my fucking?" Because Trip's like, Bleh, and throws the canteen. And Trip's like, yo, that's my water, man. <laughs> um, and Trip's like, what the hell are you trying to? I'm like, jeez, it's what he drinks, Trip. Calm down, man. Um, anyways, we get some sweaty, greasy Trip action. He ends up cutting himself, and then an alien spits on his cut. Horks the healing Lukey. Um, And that worked. Yep. His, his, Instantly. His, his cut healed up, so that's pretty convenient. Uh, I said medical spit must be in, like an incredibly useful battlefield tool. <laughs> really, though? Dr. Flox is going to pick up an Arconian for the menagerie. <laughs> that's spit on He should egg. just be the doctor. <laughs> He's like, I don't know anything. I just spit on everybody who comes in and hopes <laughs> that they get done. <laughs> he's, he's triage. If his spit doesn't work, he goes to the next doctor. There you go. Yep. They're trying to communicate... Trip is like, yo, I think I need I need actual water. Your shit's not working for me. And plus, we need to do something about this thing. He says it's like talking to Porthos, which is a little rude. Like, <laughs> Jesus, yeah. Trip. And then I guess, like, I have to do the leg sweep. Um, I'm guessing, like, oh, yeah, this is where Trip Trip's like, here, come here, look at this. And he sprays him in the face with some kind of chemical Oil or something. And, yeah. like, gets the drop on him. And now, and now the tables are turned. And Trip's mm-hmm. got the gun. And the dude's on his legs again but he doesn't do the leg sweep this time i guess he only had one he was <laughs> only given one, one leg sweep bullet so See, like he knew he trip it. would just like jump over it this time so. oh yeah trip's learning <laughs> yeah on uh as we come back from act three uh two act three um the uh we're back on the enterprise and to paul's like captain uh you have a uh, fucking hot captain there's a something you should see and the captain's like, what is it, science officer? And she's like, see for yourself. It just kind of backs up. And then, predictably, Archer looks in the incredibly advanced <laughs> scientific the apparatus and goes, I don't know what the fuck I'm looking at. Which, to Archer's credit. Fair. Yeah, fucking fair. What the, <laughs> what the fuck do you mean, see for yourself? That's not what this is your job. <laughs> what a weird thing for a Vulcan science officer to see for yourself. Check it out, dumbass. Fucking, is she mad at him? I don't know what happened there. <laughs> someone probably, someone probably put her uniform in the dryer and it shrank a little bit. Oh God, so it's Whoa. even tighter. Oh, uh, like in uh, Periscope Down. Yeah, that obscure ass oh, movie that no yeah. one else has seen. Yeah. No, I love that movie. Kelsey Grammer. That's right. The yeah. sub captain of like a diesel sub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was great. Yeah. So now we're back at Trip's shuttle. The alien is tied up and Trip is still working on stuff because he's the engineer. The alien is just a soldier. I, I said, like, I feel like the alien may have let you go get water if you were just a touch more reasonable about it. But he gives the alien chocolate. The alien doesn't care for the chocolate. I, I don't know what he's actually eating, but it looked like a big old chocolate bar. Yeah, it looked like a protein bar or something. Yeah. The alien's like, can I can I go back to my ship for some food? And Trip's like, no, fuck you, because <laughs> Trip has learned nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and has decided to also be a dick. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's more of a eye for an eye type of guy, I guess. And uh, he says, uh, you know, if, if, as soon as I get us off this planet, we get a universal translator. First words out of your mouth better be uh, thank you. And I'm like, the first words out of yours better be sorry about that. What the fuck, dude? Like, Trip I mean, is a complete asshole I mean, this guy. I mean, he did shoot him down. So, you know. He also so, shot him, you know, at his camp. No, yeah. he shot at him at his camp. He didn't no, hit he him. Also nope. shot him. Yes. Yeah, after no, he, he swept the leg. Remember? No, no, no. Yeah, that was the shot to the that was at the at the aliens camp. He shot him in yeah. the balls. Yes. Yeah. All right. I don't. 
I, I don't think I'm with you on this one. <laughs> the, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on this on alien side. side. I think he's the. I think he's the. I think he's in the moral. He's range. the protagonist he's, of the situation. <laughs> <laughs> I have no notes for the alien. I have a bunch for Trip. Uh-huh. There's a moment where I wrote. This feels like a moment where the writers are going to fuck up because, like, there's this moment where it's like. Okay, then the tide is going to turn again, and so they just have some fifty cuffs again, and then they fight for kind of a while. Like it's a long fight, not quite well, like they live long, but it's pretty long. Yeah, Alien used attack loogie. It was super effective. Yeah, it did. It worked pretty well. Um, fortunately, in the middle of the fight, the alien went for the double hammer fist, but Trip rolled out of the way, which is good because mm. his head would have exploded had he been. That's, that that would have ended the fight right there, <laughs> instant death. So they finally beat themselves to exhaustion and Trip's like, maybe we should work together. And the alien's like, fine, whatever. So now they're going to carry the transceiver up the mountain because they got it working, but there's too much interference down here in the valley. I've got, oh, she's got something. I guess she kind of, she could kind of pick up a little bit of the transmission or maybe they got, oh, maybe that was the montage. Yes. Okay. There was a montage of them going up the mountain to take the thing up the mountain and then they set it up and it's, it seems to be kind of working. Cause Hoshi's like, I got something. Um, meanwhile, the alien's not doing well, like physically, he looks kind of like yeah. bleary. Um, and trip helps him drink his, his, his drinking mud, but oh, sweaty uh, as fuck trip helps him. drink. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. Glistening in the sun. Trip, trip sweats. The alien apparently does not. And it's going to get very, very hot on the planet soon. Uh, 70 Ec- degrees. Ec- the Ecuador. alien also. This okay. is the, uh, the, the alien also declines to comment on Trip's log. On Trip's what? Log. His, his, his log. Uh, oh, that's right. That's right. I think he said no, log. He did. Yeah. What did he say? He said bad. Yeah. He said bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Enterprise is over top. Um, the, oh, I did say the head twitch thing is kind of fun because the, the alien nods in this like weird, like head twitch thing. That was yeah. a fun, that was a fun little, little, little thing. Hoshi messages Tucker and trips like Hoshi. Is that you? Who the fuck else would it be, man? So the enterprise is there, but as we found out, the shuttle pods can't get into the atmosphere. So they're like, we're going to beam you up. And Tripp's like, my buddy's really hurt over here. And Dr. Flock says, oh, man, he's really messed up. I think transporting him could be dangerous, which is a fair concept. And Tripp says, I don't want to leave him by himself. So, like, don't transport us up. And that was their only idea. So they ran out of ideas at that point. (laughs) We've tried nothing and we're all out of ideas. <laughs> Why didn't they beam anything down? To them, right. Supplies, a cooling tent, some sunscreen, some <laughs> water, a working communicator, anything. Anything at all to help this situation. Because, like, yeah, obviously, we got to get a ship down there in order to save your buddy. Fine. Dr. Flox knows enough about his physiology. Fucking send him some drinking mud. Like, ship them anything. But they decide to not do that. So I guess like in order to make it seem dramatic, they have Trip give this like final speech of shit he's seen, which is very reminiscent of like the tears in the rain speech from the original Blade Runner, like like sea beams glittering in the dark, near Tannhauser Gate, all that shit. Mm. But like. It also feels very forced because he's like his buddy's passed out. He's just like, I seen the great plume of such and such. And I got pregnant once crazy and <laughs> bang the princess. Yeah, yeah, he did too. Um, but like, it's all very like trip. Even if the shuttle pod doesn't make it on time, they'll still beam you out. <laughs> so I don't know what, <laughs> I'm not sure what the issue is for, for trip here. They missed their they missed their window. There's there's more there's more interference or something. Shut right. up. Trip t- uh, did tell the Enterprise that though the um, Earth shuttle pod won't make it on the atmosphere, he found a way that the alien shuttle pods could with just a very minor tweak. So the the alien ship that the Enterprise is working for sends their shuttle pod down to get them. For some reason, and I'm assuming it's because we don't have enough budget for sets this week. <laughs> Everybody is then on the Enterprise. 
And they blew all the budget on CG. Um, because apparently Flux is treating this dude in the Enterprise's med bay instead of, like, his med bay on his ship that's designed for his species. You shut up. <clears throat> yeah. Reasons. The archer and the captain of the other ship are chatting, and uh, he's like, uh, sorry we fired upon you without provocation, but, like, did you literally... Or, no, he said, um, he said, I need to find out why my subordinate fired on your shuttle pod without without provocation like dude you literally said y'all's job was to destroy any ships in the system like yeah it was definitely the orders that were given to that dude yeah and then um trip and the pilot can finally talk and they have the wackest fucking like exchange it's just not (laughs) like well done at all um he still wants some drinking mud i don't fucking know it gets it's weird it's a very like of all the moments that the writer needed to step up and write a good piece of dialogue that was it and they just kind of flubbed it like it just it just was not well done yeah i think i think we could have done without that scene honestly we left it as it is this would would have been fine yeah or they could have just said um you know like I don't know. Thanks. And then called it a day. I don't know. It was fucking stupid. Anyways, that was the whole thing. I don't know. Uh, I wanted to give it a two. I kind of, no, it's I'm kind of probably going to give it a three. It it's was a three. fine. Yeah. It's solid. Yeah. It was entertaining. I, th- I thought it was fine. Yeah. It, it was definitely better than like that, like string of three horrible episodes we had in a row. The scale <laughs> on one to five for everybody. Yeah. By the way, uh, oh, yeah. one is oh, where, zero is is threshold. Yeah, the scale of one to five where zero is threshold. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I would also give it a three. A three. All right. Yeah. So three is across the board. Yeah. It was just I don't know. It was fine. It was fine. Yeah, um, it was fine. As we'll get into in the deep dive, it's certainly not new territory, but it was no. fine. So, all right. Anything else on the episode before we cut? Nope. Nope. Uh, all right, then we will be back. Oh, wait, at- oh, sorry. Oh. One thing. I did remember one little detail we didn't mention. Paul was like, well, you guys did better with, with diplomacy with him than we did. Okay, yeah. thanks, Paul. Yeah. Well, turns out if, you're, if your preconceived notion is not genetically, they're just dicks. I don't know what to tell you. Like, there's <laughs> nothing we can do here. Then maybe you can actually get some fucking diplomacy done, you fucking Vulcan. God damn. All right. And with that bit of racism, we will be back after the break. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. So today for the deep dive, I want to talk about um, kind of the inspiration for this particular episode. Um, Although I want to do it in. Well, okay. so this episode, as soon as I watched it, I said, this looks like enemy mine. Have either of you seen that movie? I've heard of it. I don't know if I've actually ever seen it. Would you say, Rob? Not ringing any bells. Okay. Okay. Well, I immediately made that connection and I was like, I'm going to go to memory alpha. And in the memory alpha, like trivia section of this episode, um, they also mentioned the Blade Runner monologue, for te- the tears in the rain monologue for Blade Runner, which I was like, oh shit, I wasn't the only one who thought caught that fucking reference. But then they say it was a small and unnoticed yet acclaimed 1985 sp- science fiction film enemy mind that Dawn resembled the most down to not only the plot, but also the near identical reptilian adversary, arguably to the point of near plagiarism. <laughs> oh. I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at the movie poster for this, and I mean, yeah, but not... like, I'm pretty sure the uh, alien in Enemy Mine even had like the weird bulge in the back of the head. Hmm. Dennis Quaid starred in this too. Yes, Dennis Quaid, one of his uh, one of his uh, box office flops um here i'll put the put a picture in uh in the discord oh man love these love this these these words in the poster enemies because they were taught to be allies because they had to be brothers because they dared to be oh god (laughs) yeah that uh that's that's pretty much similar same alien so the concept of the two enemies like get stranded together and have to work together in order to get off the stranding um 
is obviously not unique to this episode of Star Trek. It was not even unique to this movie, Enemy Mine, which I'll talk about in a little bit. It is not even unique in Star Trek to this episode. Like, it has happened at other times in Star Trek. Oh, yeah. Um, In a way, Darmok is kind of that way, too. Yeah, that's actually what I had thought about. A little different, but... Um, Slightly the... different in its premise. There's also right. the, the Enemy, which was an episode of TNG that... Yep. Was, it's this, but with a Romulan. Right. And then there was a Voyager episode that was pretty similar, too, called Gravity. The, However, the premise of that as a concept seems to have started with a movie called Hell in the Pacific, which, as you might imagine, was an American soldier and a Japanese soldier who gets stranded on an island. This is a 1968 film. It's actually pretty cleverly done because there's no subtitling for the foreign language at all. Okay. So as an audience, you are also given that kind of feeling of like, I don't know what this guy is saying. Yeah. Because obviously in 1968, there were not a lot of American moviegoers who were speaking Japanese. No, I have not seen this movie. Um, I thought about watching it today just to, just to watch it, but like, I didn't really have the time. And I'm not a big World War II movie guy anyways. Um, but it seems pretty, it, you know, it seems pretty interesting. But I have seen Enemy Mine. I've seen it a couple of times. Enemy Mine is one of my mom's favorite movies. And I love my mother very much. <laughs> but God, it's not a good movie. <laughs> so in Enemy Mine, like, it's pretty much the same premise, okay? Two fighter pilots on opposing sides of the war crash onto this planet, and this planet sucks. So after they briefly, like, fisticuff and stuff, they realize that they kind of have to work together in order to live on this planet. Um, the planet has like meteors that hit it and those will kill you. But the, the planet also has like horseshoe crabs that live there and their shells are immune to meteors. They're just meteor immune shells, man. Yeah. They're real cool shells. So they, they build these little tents and stuff out of the meat, out of the meteor shells They they, I'm pretty sure they destroyed an entire ecosystem worth of these horseshoe <laughs> crabs. Um, but they're stuck on this planet for like three years. And um, they learn to speak, uh, you know, he learns to speak Drac, which is the name of the, this other guy's race. Uh, and the Drac obviously learns to speak English. And um, uh, his buddy, uh, the alien, uh, ends up pregnant because they reproduce asexually. Oh, and, like, oh they fuck? <laughs> yeah. So he calls him Jerry. And uh, then Jerry, Jerry's, uh, Jerry dies in childbirth. Uh, oh, so God, then. Jerry. Yeah, that's like that's like halfway through the movie. So then, like Dennis Quaid has to raise Jerry's kid. Um, I feel like I feel like Dennis probably isn't prepared for that. Um. Well, it was the '80s, so like a man <laughs> raising a child. Whoa! But it wasn't that bad because they didn't have a lot of time. It's only like a hundred and some odd minutes long. Yeah, one hundred and nine. It's like only like an hour and twenty minutes long. Yeah. So uh, our producer just linked a gif of Reba McIntyre singing I'm a Survivor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dennis Quaid. Uh, Dennis Quaid raises this kid and then eventually they're like rescued off the planet by like these, I don't know, these assholes or whatever. And I don't know. The, 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 the reason the movie isn't good is because not only is like the part of the movie that was like supposed to be the premise, which is these enemies become allies like that wasn't given enough screen time. Mm. And then he dies and then he has to raise the child. And then there's a whole second part of the movie where he has to like go rescue the child from slaver miners and what? then like take the kid to back to his people and recite his entire lineage it, it, it's it's like it's like they had an idea for three different movies and tried to cram them all into this one movie. This sounds like the Mandalorian. It does sound like the Mandalorian. Yeah, yeah. In between, in between when he rescues the kid and gets him back to his home, uh, there's like ten episodes of him just being a western. This movie flopped dismally in the box office. Um, what? Because mostly because it wasn't good. Chris. 
This is still only like shortly after Star Wars made like sci-fi films viable. Yeah, 1985. I'm, let's see, December 20th. I am a month and change old at this point. I hasn't been born yet. They spent, they were planning on spending 17 million. They spent 29 million. They made 12 million. Yeah, not great. Um, however, weirdly, the movie suddenly gained an enormous cult following a couple of years after it failed dismally. Hmm. And the reason is, is because for some reason, it is the first science fiction movie that was allowed in USSR theaters from America. What? So the Ooh. Russians Ooh. flipped their fucking lid for this goddamn movie. They loved it. That's funny. It has also seen somewhat of a like resurgence as people are like, oh, this is these are some pretty good themes to explore. But again, like the movie's not great. Like, it's just not good. The acting in it's okay. Dennis Quaid does all right. The, the other dude's got so much fucking makeup on that he yeah. can't really act. Like, I've and, seen Star Trek Aliens act. It's, <laughs> it's rough. right. Right. I mean, it's a lot like if Castaway, instead of the volleyball, like if the volleyball could move <laughs> its face alien. a little bit. Yeah. It's pretty much, it's pretty much the whole movie. God. Um... Wilson, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've got your baby, Wilson. <laughs> it's a it's tennis, like ball. tennis ball. Fucking tennis ball. Yes. <laughs> 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 oh, Chris. He's gonna he's gonna take it to a club and give a speech about how this tennis ball is gonna noble lineage. <laughs> oh shit. Oh fucking hell. Um. So, yeah, so obviously this episode is based very, very heavily, damn near plagiaristically so, upon this dumb movie. And I don't know, I thought I thought that was kind of fun um, because it's a movie I've actually seen. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, it is worth your time to watch this movie if you have nothing better to do. I mean, it's an hour. It's, it's you know, an hour and 20 minutes, so not even a long movie. Was it, did you say it's 109? That's almost yeah. two hours. It's an hour and 28, right? Or whatever. Is that what I said? I don't know yeah. how long hours are. An hour and 48 minutes. Hour and 40 minutes. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so, I can't, can't be doing no hexa fucking dodeca math in, in addition <laughs> do, to. Dodeca math. It was fucking, <laughs> fucking sixes and twelves and shit. Fives and twelves. I don't know. Fucking time, man. Yeah. Yeah, that's all I really had. Um, it, it is interesting to see the kind of like origin of it, it's interesting when there is like a kind of obscure origin to the idea of a Star Trek episode. And mm -hmm. then to see this where it is not obscure, it is obvious that they straight ripped pretty much everything about this, except for the final part, which except for the part where the alien had to have a baby. But like they were out of time. They, basically they, already just had, took... they already got tripped pregnant once. They couldn't do it again. Well, th yeah, that's true. <laughs> I mean, they could. <laughs> they could. I'm not even sure they don't. Like, I don't remember well enough. Trip might get pregnant again. Do you think that's why they had Trip mention he got pregnant? <laughs> Ooh, that might be. Oh, maybe. That's funny. Because that seems like a random thing to well, mention. Well, he was mentioning all of the fun adventures he had, and that is one of the fun adventures he had. <laughs> Along with banging us. that princess. Oh, man. So, yeah. Enemy Mine. Not a great movie. Go watch it. You, it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> this movie sucks. You'll love it. <laughs> oh, man. All right. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back with the potpourri. Oh, I'm glad you and I were on the same page with that Wilson joke, Chris. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, did you, know, you two plan that? Not even. I, know. Same, I never saw that movie. Same brain. You ever saw Castaway? Mm -mm. Oh, uh, it's, it's, it's right. pretty good. There's some real subtle, <laughs> and it's hard to find, but if you really pay attention, there's some subtle product placement for FedEx in it. <laughs> <laughs> Since you haven't seen the movie, I'll explain. He's flying a FedEx in a FedEx plane when it crashes. Oh, good. That's how he gets cast away. Yes, if you look at the, at the, at the title, it is not a noun. It is a verb. Um, you know, it's... It's um, Tom Hanks at kind of like during his like few year peak. So like it's 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 Excuse pretty good. Excuse me. He was in big. 
I was going to say, I, I would probably place Forest Castaway King. like shortly after his peak. Sully? No, well, n- no, Rob, that, those are those are his falling action right there. Um, Saving Private Ryan? That, right, like that that era. Saving Private Ryan, Castaway, like what those movies Cast have got Castaway became a while after our Saving a Private long, Ryan. Though. Yeah. yeah. Bullshit. I don't buy it. Hold on. Saving Private Ryan came out when we were in high school, didn't it? Two mm-hmm. years. They are separated by two years. Really? 1998 okay. and 2000. I'm shocked. Okay, so fair enough. so far apart. Yeah, those are, those are, those are in the same No, Chris, era. don't let him have it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me, let me, let me hold on. I am the... Turner and Hooch? Come on. Turner, yo, that's his early career. That's the rising action of his career. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Here, let me go to his entire disc- moviography or whatever it's fucking called. Oh, moviography. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's that's a that's a that's a word. Filmography. Show. Actor. I like moviography better. Okay. Man, I had to be used to be so much easier to navigate, and now I think I'm just old. Oh, there it goes. It just didn't load. Okay, so. <clears throat> It's not as good as it used to be. I'll agree okay, there. so yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, so we're talking. Okay, so let's see. Saving Private Ryan, okay. Before that, Apollo 13, I would say, is probably the start oh, yeah, of his yeah, yeah. Ooh, Apollo 13, yeah. Which is where he, like, because that, like, Forrest Gump was the year right before Forrest Apollo Gump. 13. For Forrest Gump, yeah. Apollo 13, I'd say those two sparked the start of the climax of his career, right? Then you've got, so that's 95, is Apollo 13. Then you've got Toy Story, okay? Mm. Ooh, Toy Story. Then you've got that thing you do, which I know was big, but I didn't see it because I'm not, you know, right. I wasn't old enough or a woman. Not a rom com guy. Huh? Yeah. Was he? Was he in the the Seattle? What was that called? Yeah. He's so we're about to get Seattle. there. Yeah. He was in Sleepless in Seattle, but that was before this. He was also in You've Got Mail, which is the You've Sleepless in Seattle yeah. remake, but involving AOL. <laughs> uh-huh. Um, Saving Private grind. Ryan, You've Got Mail. Those are 1998. Toy Story Two, The Green Mile, Castaway. Oh, yeah. Oh. Okay. Road I'll, I'll to Perdition, it. Catch Me If You Can. Like this is his, this is his fucking peak right here. Ending at, I would say, the terminal. After the terminal, like it starts going downhill. Because then you get like Polar Express, where he's in <laughs> the Uncanny Valley Express. Yes, I was gonna say that horrifying movie. <laughs> he's in the Da Vinci Code, which was dumb. Yes, but also super popular. Yeah, yeah but that. not not yeah so yeah i would say from 1995 to 2004 that is his peak that's his 10-year peak and it's all downhill in there from there so yeah there you go that is my more my time on tom hanks my tom your hanks. second deep dive my second deep dive on tom hanks why were we talking about tom hanks our our wilson joke oh because you're wilson joke okay there we go thanks <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. So, uh, for to this episode's potpourri, um, I slash actually Stanford had the idea of uh, from a couple episodes ago of doing a kind of uh, old pitch meeting for various uh, other ideas uh, for Star Trek that maybe don't conform to the the classic Star Trek uh, format. So. I don't know. Is it, does anybody have something they want to start with or? Um, I have a fun one. Okay. Go for it. I can lead us off. Yeah. So, um, I, I don't have a lot of exposure to Voyager, but through doing this podcast, and a lot of research we've had to do for like deep dives and some of the potpourri sections. Um, I've grown to, be really interested in the whole Maquis resistance and like the Cardassian wars. They they're just some of the more like interesting interfactional drama that we've seen in Star Trek. Like you get a little bit of it in Deep Space Nine too with the Maquis, but like I don't know. It it's just it's very cool. It it's not the the cut and dry like yeah you know hey here's some Klingons that are clearly angry and are just going to kill you if you don't kill them first. Like it, right it was here's a, a little whole... deeper than that. A whole race of assholes. Yeah. Right. I think (laughs) there is tremendous narrative space to explore in something like that. I, I, yes, I heartily agree. That would be, um, a lot of fun to look to, to, to watch. I would think. 
Yeah. So uh, my my pitch is that you've got a unit of Federation Marines that wind up um, basically defecting and switching sides to the Maquis and joining them in their fight against their Cardassian oppressors. And through some stroke of luck, manage to avoid the slaughter that effectively ends the resistance elsewhere. And you would like have this show where you see them then build, like rebuild the resistance within Cardassian territory, and then ultimately establish a free but unrecognized independent faction outside of the Federation and outside of the, the, the Dominion. I think it's really important that we make our listeners aware that Rob is a Star Wars guy. Why? I was just about to be like, so you want to do Star Wars, but with Star Trek, but then I saw Mariah unmuted her mic, and I'm like, this is going to the same thing. All right, that's fair. That's fair. I didn't think about that's it that way. That's the most Star yes. Wars thing I've ever heard, Rob. You're adorable. <laughs> that's funny. I mean, there's... There's room for it. I mean, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that would be an interesting and different, um, different Star Trek for sure. That is, I, I like, feel I like, like, oh, sorry, go ahead, Rob. I, I feel like narratively, um, the Maquis, they were used as like a plot device and then quickly swept under the rug in a lot of ways. So I, I think like seeing them get to play out in a longer form would be better. I, I like I like the initial premise. I'm not as sold on the, cause obviously I'm the one who's going to be funding this. Um, <laughs> I'm, not as, I'm not as sold on the um, rebuilding the Maquis section of it. I wonder if it would do, a, if it would do well as like a, um, like a band of brothers esque, like military show where you follow mm. these guys as they defect and like fight through the Cardassians and like have to, show the Maquis that they can actually be trusted and all this other stuff, you know? That'd be mm, fun. That would be cool. Yeah, and, like, they eventually get to, like, be brought back into the fold when when the war is, like, called off. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, that would be an interesting direction. Do you think we could get Tom Hanks in that one? <laughs> T. Hanks. Definitely. He did. He did. He was an uncredited cameo in the original Band of Brothers. Oh, really? I didn't know that. I didn't either until I was looking at that IMDb page. He's a <laughs> British officer. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. It's been a while since I've watched it. Interesting. Interesting. I would watch that. So mine's weirdly tangentially related. Oh. Not so much about the McKee specifically, but I also envisioned a show that takes place kind of like in a frictiony borderland between the Federation and another place. Um, I call it Star Trek Hinterlands. All right. <laughs> And the background is that a relatively freshly colonized system, like maybe the last like few decades, uh, maybe as much as like 60 years um, under direct Federation control um, is because of some kind of treaty. Suddenly the system is forced to be neutral. They are no longer allowed to be considered a Federation system. And the uh, Federation is basically just pulling out. They have, they're required by this treaty to pull out. So our show starts with them pulling out. And anyone left behind, it is be, like the, the, the Federation says, if you get on board, we will relocate you. We will get you figured out. But if you stay here, you're no longer a protected Federation citizen. And the show will. So that's like that's like the opening act of the show. And so the show kind of pro follows the, you know, the, the Maki 2.0. Yeah. <laughs> Rocky 2.0. Maki. Oh, Maki 2.0. Well, so no, I wasn't envisioning that they would necessarily be like rebels per se, but like the following three sets of people in this system. There's mm. some people that operate a mining and trading station that's out in space. There are people who are in like the largest organized settlement, which is basically like a small town on one of the planets. And then there's a scientific outpost that a bunch of scientists have decided that like, our research is too important to leave. And so these three groups of people now are in a situation where before they had all this support and infrastructure and guarantees. Now these three groups of people are completely on their own and are only dependent on each other and their motives are not the same. Right. So I thought it would be kind of interesting to explore how that kind of stuff would 
impact the relationships between some of these people. Now there are like more outside threats that they didn't have to worry about before because the Federation is not patrolling here anymore. Um, and you know, that, that those kinds of storylines that you could explore basically life outside of like one of the empires. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. And interesting. Like there's, there's definitely, uh, some interesting things that could, you know, explore there. I just like the idea of seeing things outside of like the Federation. Like yes. I love Starfleet. I love Star Trek. But it would be cool to see them explore right. like some non Federation like lore, you know. So uh, I'll stop right there because that actually kind of leads into <laughs> what my <laughs> idea was, um, and and I have the same thought, Rob. Is is that you know every Star Trek series is based off of the crew of the starship uh, from the Federation, mostly the Enterprise, doing their enterprisey things. Uh, the USS Goody Two Shoes. Yes. So um, I thought, man, what could, what are some possible things? So I I, I kind of came up with a few different ideas, and I didn't like them as like a a solo show that could you know have a long run. So I'm thinking this is like the perfect type of thing to explore in something like an anthology series. Um, and I do enjoy an anthology series. Um, what does that mean? So that's like a collection of different, um, sometimes it's, it's, you know, I don't want to say episodes, but they're usually centered around some type of theme, but they're like actually, books. yeah, but they're actually produced by like different groups usually. Um, so you get different art styles and different, you know, okay. directing styles, um, and like you know, in, some, in, Enter the Matrix or the Animatrix, yes, or like exactly, uh, yeah. or like uh, VHS, Love Death, Love Death Robots, those type of things. Right. Okay. 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 Gotcha. Um, because I think you have obviously a lot of room to explore. You can make it very artistic if you want to. Um, like you could do, you could do a day in the life of Spot. Um, just just Spot meandering through the Enterprise as all shits breaking loose. You could do, um, kind of a, a first contact, but from the aliens' point of view instead of you know, Enterprise's point of view or whatever other starship it is. You could do, you know, interaction between Cleons and Cardassians. Um, you could do, like I said, just basically anything that's not <laughs> the Federation. Oh, man. Doing a first contact where, like, you don't tell the viewers that they're looking at a Federation first right. contact until exactly. the very end. <laughs> so they're like, Man, these guys are just pompous douche nozzles, and then exactly. it turns out it's the Federation. <laughs> it's like, ah, right. Or, or you could follow. You could even That's do a like a what happened after um, mm. of some type of you know next generation planet that Picard negotiated some bullshittery with, and then like we're three years down the line and all the fucking shit's gone to, <laughs> gone to pot. So yeah, I would love to just like a quick episode about like what is life like for a person who's in the Federation, but not in fucking Starfleet? Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're just a civilian and yeah. there it's during the, the Cardassian, you know, war or whatever. And they're just happy to be there. Or, you know, even early on, we you know, uh, kind of just, TOS <laughs> period where it's Klingons just, or whatever. You just have like, Oh no, no, no. Here, here's, here's my submission to the anthology, right? We follow one guy and like, he's just telling about his family and every single like existential crisis humanity has ever faced. He's got a family member that was like witnessing. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, it's God. like, yeah. So it's like, yeah. Then the Borg showed up when my great, great grandfather. <laughs> and then like, yeah, the, these, this thing of with some whales came by <laughs> and the, like, m you know, my great, great uncle almost oh, didn't perfect. make it. I love like, that. And that's like the entire episode is just like this. It's guy. like it's done like in like documentary a style, it's right? Like therapy just... or something. Yay. Oh, a documentary. Yeah. The, the, the most unlucky man in the Federation. Right. Like, yeah. The, the unluckiest family <laughs> yeah. in Starfleet history. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and they're you're never... making this. You're making this person sound like a millennial, <laughs> right? But like, no, he's not personally witnessing it. Like, it's because these His these existential crises are over over all of these different years. But yeah, it could be like, like a twenty minute thing, and it's like dives right. back into great great fan grand grandfather's experience for like five minutes, and then grandfather's right, right. experience. And for they're five never minutes. like he's never. None of them are in Starfleet. They're just like the. The fucking civilians who had to witness the shit happening around them. <laughs> it's 
like, yeah, that my that my great great aunt was just a daycare worker on the Enterprise, and then it got stuck in a time loop, and she had to change the same diaper forty eight times in a row. Like, Every time it relooped, she was squirting diarrhea in her face. <laughs> All right, if I ever get to make a fan film. Oh god. It's perfect. See, this and you could that's the thing. Like you you could shift the tone completely. Like Absolutely. some of them could be silly, some of them could be, you know, serious or artsy or whatever. So, uh, it's it would be a lot of fun, I think. Yeah, that'd be good. That'd be good. Oh man, any of these shows would be better than the shit we've got. <laughs> <laughs> no. The problem with Star Trek and like and and obviously based on the 3 Things that we have pitched so far, although Chris just pitched the concept of anything else, please. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. I did have that thought when I was like, I'm like, you know what? This is just kind of a cop out a little bit, but. Um, but um, is the idea that like Star Trek hasn't changed all that much in its central themes and stuff. And it's like, right. all right, we could we could explore some right. new areas. Right, exactly. It would be OK. I and mean, that's kind of why, like, I'm like in an anthology series, because like not everything has to be like a long form thing. Right. Like there's room to explore shorter things that aren't in, you know, just an episode of a larger series. Absolutely. William Gibson says that the, the, the best science fiction is short story. Mm-hmm. Don't tell that to Larry Niven. <laughs> Ooh, Niven writes some long ass shit. He has some shorter stuff too. That's all pretty good, but it's his older stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Good job, Chris. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, I think that will wrap up the potpourri section. Um, as a reminder, everybody, as Stanford mentioned at the top of the podcast, any type of likes, reviews, spread the word uh, will help us tremendously. We are just getting started out still, even though we're, I guess, a season and a half in at this point. But, uh, you know, anything helps. Emails, do all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, we will catch you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to Captain's Log Supplemental. You can follow us on Twitter at PodCLS or send us hate mail at PodCLS3 at gmail.com.